Welcome in to another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Vogt, Derek Young here with you as we get set coming off of a weekend where all football for the 2023 season is officially finished with the Super Bowl having gone by and everything now firmly, whether it's pro or college, being focused on the future and what's to come in 2024 for the entirety of that season where we're uh, basically six and a half months away from all of that getting started. It's never a bad time to take a look at expectations and everything else that there is going into the upcoming year for K-State because they're in a position where we know that there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of optimism in spots on the roster, and I think when that happens, there is a tendency sometimes to overlook or forget just how many questions might lurk in other areas. I, I think in part last year, one of the things that ended up you know, getting K-State was um, early on, I, there, there were probably more questions about the defense than even what people brought up. But at the end of the day, the defense wasn't the issue. It was the, the really game. the offense and what you thought was going to be – yeah, to the last game. the uh, you, you thought the offense would be fine, but one of the things you thought you had answered, it was kind of shaky too. So there's a lot to, to kind of go into here, and uh, we'll, we'll tack it from a couple of different angles, seeing what the expectations are for K-State in 2024 and, and how this team manages them. I think that will be an interesting thing as well so i mean we talked about it when the schedule came out uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and just how it looks and we were kind of going man it, you never want to be the guy that just says they win every game but we looked every at it yeah. every game is winnable and there's a chance that you know maybe some maybe a road game gets funky or so, something but there's a chance k-state's the favorite in every game that they play this coming year because of where it's at and who they're playing so what what is just the the baseline expectation for you in 2024 for K-State? There is a chance that they are favored in every game. And especially, and I hadn't even thought of that until you said it, but every opponent that they play, I believe, has a less a win total in terms of the books, what well, they have it. The let me I'll just throw them up for you right now. FanDuel released their win totals last week. Uh, for the Big 12 and all the, the power conferences in football. And K-State and Utah are at 9.5 in the Big 12, and then a handful at 8.5 with KU, Arizona Tech, and UCF, and then three at 7.5 at TCU. It'll be interesting. Uh, I That feels like maybe an easy under, but I'd have to look at their schedule. And then West Virginia at 6.5, and, and then the rest of the league is at 5.5 or worse. So that, that's the look right there. But, yeah, the, Utah is the only one that matches them in terms of what the total was set at. And you don't play Utah unless it's the Big 12 title game. Yeah, so looking at it that way, you know, perhaps Kansas State is the favorite in every game that they play this year. Now, maybe one of those road games, they, they end up like a, a short dog, right? Um, although some even the ones that are eight and a half, I don't think K-State plays on the road, so – um, that it'll be interesting, like you said, could could be the favorite every game. Baseline expectations. Look, I think when you had the old rendition of the Big 12, and we kind of touched on this when we did the schedule takeaways a little bit. Like your baseline was seven to eight wins. It feels like if that's your baseline in that rendition of the Big 12, and now with you know, you've also kind of moved forward with Chris Kleiman. You already had a Big 12 title under your belt as well. Uh, last year, you won eight. It just feels like maybe eight still the, the has to be the low mark, but it almost feels like you got to graduate to nine, in my opinion. I think you're right. I mean, you look at the schedule, and uh, it, it's, it's no doubt tricky. You've got, you know, a road non-conference game at a team that has been good in past years, but there's a coaching change personnel is kind of turned over for the most part and then Arizona is a team that probably was the best team on your schedule when the season ended but they've gone through a coaching change and they've retained personnel fairly well considering the coaching change but that's still a question mark and I think that's probably why their win total is knocked down to eight and a half and then after that it's a lot of teams are I mean we, we saw earlier like BYU Colorado uh, West Virginia, Houston, Arizona State, Cincinnati. Those are teams that are not highly thought of going into 2024. And some of them, they might have the talent and like that that road game can get you sometimes. So maybe they can sneak up and get you. 
But Chris Kleiman has typically done a pretty good job, especially in conference play, of avoiding, you know, kind of the the shocking loss outside of 2019 West Virginia at home. And then obviously uh, you mentioned it already, and I think it will get tossed in left and right, the Iowa State game in 2023, uh, but some kind of different circumstances that caused that. But for the most part, he is a guy that takes care of business. And we saw that really in 2023 where basically every game was either a close loss or a blowout win for K-State because – They just beat the snot out of UCF, Houston, and TCU at home. And then on the road, outside of the KU game, they they either struggled to win or that was comfortable as well Uh, because the Texas Tech game really wasn't much of a question once we got to the fourth quarter. So it's interesting to think about where K-State could be, but I'm with you because I view it as this new league, teams like K-State and Oklahoma State probably walk into it and feel like, We've been pretty darn consistent in the old Big 12, and that was with two teams that are far greater than what we have in terms of resources and history and all this other stuff. But we were still like, we should win eight games every year probably. Nine every three years would be what we want and have that one year where you kind of get that special level. With the new league and, and all these teams in there, the, the ceiling raises for K-State. You're in a different class now. You you have slid into a top tier, whereas they were kind of tier two, and that's not a bad thing in the old Big 12. So I think expectations have to be elevated. And I, I, think, I think 10 wins this season, given what you've got, probably seems like a good target. Probably, and I agree on the elevated expectations. I don't know that I agree on an elevated ceiling because, look, Two times out of four or five years, if you were at Kansas State, you felt like you were probably, you know, for the most part, going to have a chance to play meaningful in November, meaningful football in November to play for a Big 12 championship. I don't know that that part necessarily changes a lot. Maybe another year tossed in there. I think we're talking about raising the floor now, in my opinion. I think that's probably the better descriptor of how it looks. The only thing that I have pause about when it comes to this year's schedule, like we said, Maybe the favorite in every game. Every game appears to be winnable. You got some teams in there where you should be overwhelmingly ahead of as a program. But it's just the way that that first part of the schedule is structured. You're probably going to get most of your tough games out of the way in the first half of the season compared to the second half. And also the structure of it, like the kind of road games that we're talking about when you're going to elevation twice right? You're going to altitude twice. You play a tough Arizona team in the non-con that was you're heading into before the coaching change, probably the best team you're going to play this year and a tricky G5 road game. It really felt like the schedule that kind of doomed Texas Tech's lofty expectations last season. True. So that's where my pause comes in terms of the schedule. Expectation-wise, when it comes to Kansas State and focusing on them, I, I really like what they have. And Obviously, a lot of that revolves around Avery Johnson, but he sound, sounds like, you know, I just wrote a story and it kind of centers, you know, in our nuggets, um, kind of just giving out some inside information. It kind of revolves around him being considered better than advertised so far, and that's a huge deal because the advertising is pretty overwhelmingly positive as well. So if we're talking about better than advertised, that's saying something, and it doesn't feel like, you know, a lot of times when the hype machine can kind of get overwhelming and kind of go out of control, and it always will when it associates or revolves around Avery Johnson, that's just a part of the beast when it comes to his hype and his popularity and what he means to the program, especially being as an in-state kid and what he's actually capable of and, and you know, his high ceiling and potential. But a lot of times this stuff, when it gets overwhelming, gets out of control, coaches always have an instinct to want to suppress it a little bit, and I think that's for two reasons. One, they don't know if that particular kid can handle that hype and be mature enough to approach it with the right amount, you know, of I still got to be hungry. I still got to go get this right. Um, and two, the other alter or the other reason why they, they sometimes want to suppress it is it's not accurate, right? They're like, okay, I think we're thinking this kid's going to be giving us, you guys think this kid's going to be giving us a little bit more than what he's actually capable of. So it's either he can't handle it or he might not be good enough for this. And, and the coach is always like, hey, hey, watch, you know, but let's let's be careful here with the expectations, with the hype. 
doesn't seem like that's ever happened or it's ever been an instinct yeah. from the state coaches when it comes to Avery. Yeah, they they I think they know what they have in him, and I think yes, they know well. what his makeup is. Yeah, they in like early last year, it was like they were talking before you even thought they might even start saying good things about him being like, yeah, like you know, he's 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 been he's been really good, like he's impressive, all this stuff. And then it was like he was instantly yeah, you know, he might be the backup quarterback and all this stuff. And I, I didn't think that it would happen as fast as it did last year. You know, I thought that – because I just think in football, coaches tend to slow play things a lot more than sometimes they need to. And so as much as this is a, a credit to Avery Johnson and how talented and special as he is, I also think what happened last year and how they handled the Avery Johnson situation behind Will Howard, uh, mainly between Avery Johnson and Jake Rubley, like – that's a credit to Chris Klein and, and Colin Klein and the entire coaching staff because I think a lot of other places, even if Avery Johnson's talent and and makeup and everything else smacks you across the face, you'd still wipe it off and go, yeah, but he's you know he's 18 years old, he's he's a true freshman. Like this is really going to be our backup quarterback. Like no, he he can wait, he can hang out. It's fine. There's no rush. And I they were smart enough to realize that that's silly to do when you have somebody as talented as him. And I think they had like learning moments throughout the year last year where, you know, they realized they maybe could have used him more or, or done something differently, but for the most part, they handled it well. And it's, it leads to what should be a pretty productive 2024 for K state. Now, in terms of the entirety of the team, because there are more than one guy on this team, you know, it's not just Avery Johnson and the other guys are pretty darn good too. You, you bring DJ Giddens back and the wide receiver stable it grew a little bit last year. Jace Brown had a phenomenal true freshman season. You hope that, you know, you get a better season out of Keegan Johnson now that he's in his second year in the program. Maybe he can stay healthier. And you've also added Dante Cephas, a Penn State transfer, who, you know, was highly sought after a season ago when he left Kent State. So what is the expectation for everybody else on this roster, and what can the, the total of this team turn into? Well, I think DJ get into – is probably a guy that's going to play on Sundays at some point. So that, that, I mean, I, that seems overwhelmingly positive too. Right. Um, or maybe I'm, people will probably think I'm jumping the shark. I think DJ Giddens is that good. And then you talk about the tight end, you lose Ben Sennett. That's going to, regardless of how good we think Garrett Oakley can be, he's not going to be as good as Ben Sennett was the last two years right away. Like he can get to that point And some people think his potential is there but it's not going to happen overnight. So tight end, it's a good spot. It's not going to be as elite as it once was the past two seasons. It's just a hard thing to expect out of a kid. Now Gary Oakley does that, and he can, he can slap me in the face and tell me I'm stupid. But I I think that there will be like a, you know, a slow build there. But I think he's going to be really good. And it's not that I don't think he's talented or that I don't think he's dependable. I think it's going to take some work. It's going to take some – more experience. He's as he started a game before besides the bowl game. I don't think so. So there's there's a level there that, of building and growth and development that still needs to happen as well, and a, kind of to stay healthy. Wide receiver is probably where I'm going to be the most different than everyone. I think this unit has a chance to be better than last year's. And yes, that's not saying a whole lot, but to some because they were probably pretty underwhelmed by the production. It did get a little better as the year got on. I think Keegan Johnson does better in year two. I think some transfers struggle in that first year because it is a new thing and you have to prove yourself all over again. He also dealt with injuries. I'm bullish on Keegan Johnson in year two. I'm bullish on Jace Brown, of course. I think he's got a huge, huge future in front of him if he continues to be as hungry as he was in year one. And then we're talking about Dante Sivas probably as your third starter there. and that's a guy that's probably hungry to prove people wrong for what happened to Penn State. Now, he was still the second leading wide receiver on that team. Um, so you could still make the argument that the offense was probably as big as a knock as anything that he was doing personally. He gets here early he's in spring or going through workouts. He's going to learn everything you know, pretty quickly, which some people said was the drawback at Penn State. He had a hard – he the learning curve with the new playbook hurt him, and he wasn't there for spring ball, and that – kind of, you know, snowballed him in a, a little bit. So he at least won't have that hurdle at Kansas State. And then you have Jaden Jackson. I mean, that's a pretty reliable fourth receiver, whatever you think of him, right? Um, Trey Spivey, you would think he has to 
you know, anywhere but up at this point. A uh, guy was really talented last year, just, you know, between the years was still grasping everything. And really the only one you're losing, right, is Philip Brooks. Love Phil, love Philip Brooks. Great interview. Um, we got to be around him for, you know, plenty of years. For a decade. And this is not this is not a knock on him, but he is certainly replaceable. His, his talent is replaceable. You can get more talented than Philip Brooks realistically mm-hmm. pretty quick. Now, dependability, that's where it's a little bit harder to replace, and someone's got to prove that they can be depended upon just as much. Yeah, that's a good point. I, Philip Brooks, honestly, he, he kind of took off the last probably five, six games of last season where it, it feels like at one point we did a show and we made a comment about like, Philip Brooks is not going up and getting balls for you. And then Philip Brooks started going up and getting balls for you and, and kind of added on to his skills, which was already, like you said, he was dependable uh, and he was really good at that. And, but you, you can find more talent and, you know, Phil, like Philip Brooks, I think maximized what he could be at K state given the circumstances, but K state has an opportunity to be better there. I'm with you on that. And then defensively, what, what is K state looking at here? Cause we know that, Things got a little dicey with, you know, maybe there was going to be a lack of depth on the defensive line. They were able to salvage some of that. You're maybe expecting, like, obviously the return of some health at linebacker because Ace Newsom and Jake Clifton, both, they went down at different points last season. Clifton went down twice and then was eventually done. Uh, and then everything else. So where where does the defense stack up in terms of expectations? And, and is this maybe where people should pump the brakes on what to see from K-State in 2024? Well, we didn't tackle the one thing where I would have a question mark or pump the brakes a little bit was the offensive line. When it comes to the offense, you're replacing KT Leviston, Christian Duffy, Cooper BB, and had uh, Aiden Gillip. So we'll see how that works itself out. Um, not saying that's the end all be all, but it's hard to be a good offense with a below average offensive line, uh, regardless of what you have everywhere else. Colorado. So, they, <laughs> so you need to get to a certain level so that your potential can be reached. I don't expect this offensive line to be as good as it was last year, the year before. I get that. But you do have guys that are coming back with experience. Hadley Panzer, Taylor Portier, Carver Willis. You're going to need some guys to step up like John Pastore, Andrew Leingang. Um, And, you know, the baptism by fire. They don't get an ease ease into it when they're playing Tulane in Arizona in game two and game three. So, um you you worry about the offensive line maybe in those two games because those are two teams that can probably pay make you pay if your offensive line isn't ready to go. I now with Connor Riley, the talent that they have recruited at that position, I think it's going to be good enough. So, but we'll see. Defensively, you're right. They retooled the defensive line. I'm not sure how all the pieces are going to fit, but when you have Uso Sayamalo, when you have Damian Alalio, Brendan Mott, Javon Banks, Travis Bates. Jordan Allen, Chidi Obiizer, and then Malcolm Alcorn Crowder still has to get to campus expecting him in March. That's enough, right? I just rattled off four, five, six, eight guys that we think can play on the defensive line. Mm-hmm. Um, that's plenty. The depth is there. Um, some of them got to be a little bit more consistent, you know, make more of a splash, but I think the depth is there. Linebacker, some will depend on guys and how soon they can come back. We're talking about Asa Newsom and Jake Clifton. Uh, especially Jake Clifton. I think he can make it work for you because you're expecting Austin Moore and Des Purnell to be two of your starters. Uh, so you have that question mark on Mike. You have, you know, Bo Palmer and Austin Romain can do it, but you'd probably rather it be Jake Clifton, I think. So, but if it is Jake Clifton and if he is ready, if he can get back, it would be, have to be a pretty quick turnaround. It wouldn't surprise me if he misses a game or two um, just because he probably won't be ready to go completely by, by fall camp if he is. It's great for Kansas State, but Austin Romain, Bo Palmer as you know, middle linebacker two, middle linebacker three. That's good. Um, Austin Moore as your will. That's good, right? Uh, who's your backup will? That's probably Asa Newsom. Is he ready or is it Rex Van Y? Toby Osinsami, I haven't mentioned him. He can play the D line or at linebacker. Uh, so I, I think you need some health. Good. You need some luck on the health part, but the front I really like. The the depth at cornerback is probably your question mark because you know what you got with Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish. How good are Justice Jones, Tyler Nalome, and Kenigel Thomas? We don't know yet. 
Safeties, I think, was retooled enough. You're, you're bringing back two of your starters, and Marquis Siegel and VJ Payne. Jordan Riley seems like a really good transfer yeah. to be your other starter. Uh, Juco Dante Thomas, can he play right away? If not, that's fine. You got Colby McAllister, right? Uh, they, get his name right, Strap. Strap Thomas, there you go. Uh, Steiger's still around, and Daniel Cobbs are still around. Mm -hmm. um, Jack Fabers played last year. So I, I, I feel moderately okay about safety. I feel – Decent about linebacker, need some stroke of luck at you know the injury front. The defensive line, maybe I twinge a little bit of hesitation about the interior, but they have so many bodies that I think they can figure it out because not all those guys are going to play defensive end. Yeah. And then corner, you need depth. I think it's uh, you know, I think it's tough because this this defense coming back, there's not any of the at the moment, like the wow players that have been there over the past couple of seasons. So you're you're just going to wait to see who can step up and have the the big night. But honestly, uh, you you know you paint the picture. It is pretty consistent across the board. You feel like that, you should get a pretty cool. consistent performance from everybody, and that's nope. that's sometimes a better thing than having you know one guy you rely on to kind of be the the game wrecker for you. Just not a huge hole or deficiency, like. You can, you know, squint a little bit and say a injury here or injury there makes you can make you weak pretty quickly in a couple spots. So they do need to address some depth. Yeah, and you mentioned Payne and Siegel at safety. I think you know the Siegel's latter really part cool. of last year they they started to come around and play better once they got you know kind of put in the right spots and and they started I think to be more comfortable in their roles because I mean obviously relatively. Siegel's not necessarily young, but he's young in terms of he'd never played at the FBS level before. And obviously VJ Payne was, you know, still in just the second year. So there's a lot of learning that had to be done. And I think they they started to learn the last half of the year. I wish he could catch the ball, but I think Marquis <laughs> Siegel is an all Big 12 player. Man, it he might he might be a, he'd be an all American if he could catch the ball. He would have had a thousand picks last year. Uh I think I can guarantee you game number one. 2024 UT Martin. That will be one of my predictions for the game that Marquis Seal gets a pick because I think I did it for almost every single game last year. Uh, and he almost did it in every single game. He just very rarely actually hung on. That, that's why he's good though. Now you got to finish the mm -hmm. play, but no, I've never seen a player in, in position for so many interceptions as he is. That's true. That I, you're right. I've not seen a DB get his hand on so many balls consistently as Marquis Siegel. Uh, final thing here, because we know what the win totals look like. We know what the schedule looks like. We know what the personnel is. K-State came into last season. I think they were 19 to start the year uh, in the top 25. Uh, you can see here below us, there are a handful of different, you know, spots that have K-State in the top 25, where would you put K-State in the top 25 or what feels right to you? Because, I mean, it's all across the board. You see some yeah. in the top 15 area, others outside of the 20. Uh, everybody's favorite, uh, Stuart Mandel, had K-State outside of his, his 2024 top 25. So congrats to Stu. He continues to be an idiot. What feels right for K-State with preseason expectations nationally next year? Because you have to rebuild the offensive line to an extent, you're losing your top tight end, your leading receiver, uh, your number two running back, technically your starting quarterback, although everyone loves Avery. I get it. Like 12, all of that, and then you know maybe some death things that, on the defense, all that makes 12 and 14 sound very high, right? Like Because last year's team was coming off a Big 12 championship with yeah. a lot more returning production, and they started 19, as you said. So I'll just say this, 12, 14, Maybe even the 17 feels a little high. All right. So you're a hater too, I guess. I, I well, didn't expect I, I would, that. I'd be in the, what is it, ESPN PFF range. I'm not going to acknowledge Sports Illustrated they're, they're, at this point. That's a joke. Uh, I'm trying to think who uh, – one of one of those or maybe multiple of them uh, had, had KU higher than K-State going into next year in the, the top 25, which – People will hate when I say this, but I would have them – Rank pretty similarly, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess if I guess if Jalen Daniels does play, yeah, uh, he'll he'll that, he'll that, look really good in the non-con game. If, if you work under that assumption, I think you would have them ranked pretty similarly because, yeah. and we'll see what they look like without 
the off coordinator code or making maybe that has a significant impact as well. Nobody knows. Is he the secret sauce? We'll find out. Now, they did lose another really good assistant that was on the defensive side of the ball, but I think I would view him as more recruiter than, than the, the coach named Jordan Peterson. So he was their best recruiter. So that, that probably won't play out on the field in 24. Uh, here, I'll, I'll give you this option too. I'll throw the win totals back up for the league. Yeah. Uh, I, you can either rip through all of them real quick and just say over or under, or you could give one or two that, that are very obvious to you that you say, yeah, I'm going under here or over here. Let's go rapid fire. Just a gut instinct. We'll both do it. I'll go first and we'll do each one rapid fire. K state nine and a half. I'll go over. I'll say over as well. Tech eight and a half. I will go. I mean, it's hard not knowing these schedules too. We're, this is not rapid. I will go under. That's that's a jump up from last year, pretty big. Yeah, I I got burnt by the Texas Tech love last year, so I'll, I'll probably go under as well on Texas Tech. TCU, I'll go under. I'm not sure Sonny Dykes doesn't belong on Friday Watch to begin the to begin the year. Yeah, I'm with you. That's that's the one that feels like the easiest under to me is TCU right there because, yeah, Sonny Dykes did a- appear on Fraud Watch multiple times. I think he got up to maybe uh, a fraud advisory. So, yeah, he's certainly uh, in, in the running for that. Colorado, that number feels pretty accurate. I will go on the underside of that, but it's probably going to be five or six. Yeah, Colorado – I just I, I don't know, and I'm a, and I'm a Dion hater in terms of I don't think that it works long term, and I was excited to see that it didn't work short term last year. Uh, so I'm I'm going to go under there. I, I have to. Utah, I I think they may have the best coach in the Big Twelve now, and I think that uh, yeah, with Cam rising back, assuming he's healthy all year, that's over. Yeah, I think Utah's probably they, – they, from what I remember, they don't have the toughest schedule either next year. They're probably honestly having a lot of the same conversations that we are where yeah. it's, man, this team, the, the schedule is there for them. So I, I think K-State and Utah have some similar years, so I'll go over. UCF's number is high, and I think it actually is deservedly so, but I'm not ready to go over on them yet. Yeah, that seems like a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the under there – especially because, uh, and look, sometimes you, you never know what you're going to get from, but they do have a road game at Florida uh, this season. So that's a that's a tricky one. Middle of the year, by the way, that's October 5 that they oh, go wow. on the road to Florida. Uh, West Virginia, I will say under law of averages. I'm, gonna, I'm going under on all these, apparently. But someone's got to win some games, but I, yeah. I have under on West Virginia. Yeah, I'd go under on West Virginia. I think it's regression. I think last year there was a lot of fortunate circumstances for Neil Brown. He was on the hot seat, and uh, I think that it, it comes it comes back to earth, and West Virginia fans are probably back in the same boat where you have a, a football coach you don't want. Arizona State, I don't really know a lot about them. I think they're kind of a disaster as a whole when it comes to athletics, but I, maybe they can win. Uh, I'll say under barely. Uh, real quick for you, I'll give you some context on this because your under might be a good play. They, they're non-con, they host Wyoming and Mississippi State. They're also mm-hmm. on the road at Texas State who beat Baylor last year in Waco, and their first Big 12 game is at Texas Tech, and then they play KU and Utah. They also go to Stillwater and Manhattan and at Arizona, and they have a home game at UCF. I think that right there is enough to say under on Arizona State. Uh, they, there's some talent there. They have Jaden Rashad at quarterback, but it, it's still a sophomore and he didn't get to play a ton last year. So I'm going to say under, I feel like all these are going to be like under by a half. So they're well numbered by FanDuel and I wouldn't take a lot of these KU eight and a half. I would take, I, I would take the over on this one for KU. I'll go I think over. they also have a nice schedule. If Jalen Daniels plays 12 games, it's over. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, that, that's a caveat. We uh, reserve the right to change our mind if Jalen Daniels does not play a m- bunch of games. Uh, Iowa State, seven and a half. This is kind of a wild card, too, because we talked about it. Like, Rocco Beck was pretty good last year as a freshman for him, uh, and obviously they have some things to build off of. I I just don't know. It's Matt Campbell, and, it's not, and there's not a, like, pandemic going on, so – I'm going to say under by a half. So I'm going to take seven wins for Iowa State next year. I'll go over by a half, and I'll go under on Baylor. Yeah, uh, Baylor under. Dave Aranda, 
you you might want to start finding a realtor to get that house sold. <laughs> and I'll go over on BYU because I feel like that's a program that should get better over time in the Big 12. Yeah, the, I think there's an acclimation period that has to go on for them. Oddly enough, a Big 12 school that also plays a game against Wyoming next season, uh, but Wyoming, different circumstances. They also road trip to ACC opponent SMU. Um, oh, I will – this is tough. They have a lot of games that you would maybe consider winnable and easy. I think they go over. I think they go over five, and the more I, I looked at it, I think it's an easy five for BYU. I'm actually going to go under on Arizona because I'm not a believer in the new head coach. Yeah, I'm going to go under as well. And also, I think there is a, a tendency that you know things can kind of change after you have that bust out year when people weren't really expecting it. Uh, and they've got a they've got a tough go of things. They they're going to have back to back games in September against K State and Utah on the road. Over on Oklahoma State, that might be an easy one. Yeah, I'm just not going to doubt Mike Gundy anymore. Uh, I you pencil him in for eight and four almost every year because he proved me way wrong last year. So I'm going over. And it could be nine and three with Ollie Gordon and Alan Bowman both back. Cincinnati, I'll say under. Just don't like the head coach. Yeah, terrible move by by Cincinnati. They've gotten so many good football hires over the last twenty years, and Satterfield made no sense. I'm going under there as well. And Houston. I'll finish over. it off by going first. I'm going over well, at four yeah. and a half. Willie Fritz is too good of a coach. I, I don't think that they they you know go four and eight or three and nine. They will win three, probably three games because they're better than the other team, and then they will win at least two because they have a better coach. Yep, good way to put it. All right, well, that is a, a quick look at the expectations for the 2024 season for K-State and part of the Big 12. Obviously, a, a ways to go until we get into it, but – I mean, what, we're probably a month, a month and a half away from getting some spring stuff underway for K-State, getting some looks at the team, hearing from everybody. Uh, So it'll be a good time. Less, March 5th, first day of spring ball. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, So we're going to be rocking and rolling with plenty of football coverage uh, in the coming weeks, uh, which might be a good thing if uh, basketball continues to just one step back, one step forward type of deal. So that will do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Head over to kstateonline.com for more information about the Cats, get you up to date and in the know with everything we got going on at On3. So thanks for watching, K-State.